Okay, um, good morning. Um, so this morning we're going to start off with a presentation, and this is really meant to be kind of an overview and a discussion regarding um, our, best, our, our practices on how we manage uh, drainage waste, canals, um, and, and also um, areas where we have sand migration and things like that. And there's, they're involved in a number of these, but there's some policies that we kind of set on the way we operate um, over the years. So we wanted to start with doing an overview of that. We can we can continue this discussion. But there's no particular outcome or recommendation at this time, but kind of maybe you know laying a foundation of this is current practices, and then we can discuss if we need to navigate or you know uh, vary from that. We also understand that there's a lot of community interest in certain uh, parts. One of, uh, obviously there's some areas of, up north around Lake Tarpon, but also um, we're, and Kelly can kind of do an overview of that. We're actually dealing with that uh, down in some south areas or regarding sand and, and uh, passages and, and things like that. So um, Kelly's gonna give this overview and then we can uh, take this out. We can have community meetings. We can do whatever you wanna do to kind of advance this, this conversation. And that way people are at least clear and we're clear in terms of what we're how we react when we have different you know, types of situations. Um, we did try to report this. Um, as you're all aware, we're working on a solution to have better um, um, meeting space, and we're going to work on that. Um, but in the meantime, you know, we're limited with this conference room, but we did try to report it, so we do have a camera in the back. These microphones are sensitive, so if you make a side comment about you know, Kelly, well, then we're, she's going to be able to hear it later. Um, it will be recorded, so uh, uh, just so to be, be cognizant of that. And uh, Why'd you point at me? <laughs> so with that, I'm uh, going to turn it over to Kelly and uh, let her begin. Now, before Kelly begins, I just want to <laughs> congratulate her for being named one of the top environmentalists for climate change in the state of Florida. <laughs> in the Tampa Bay Times and it was um, um, wonderful. She's created a mapping tool for incorporating sea level rise into capital planning in Pinellas County and they're using it elsewhere, I believe, right? Yes, yes, they're using it elsewhere and I want to give a big shout out to, to our um, Aegis group who helped um, kind of visualize it for me and currently working with OTI to take that tool to a web-based format and we're very close. It's very exciting so that'll be a platform out there and not only will our project managers internally utilize for county projects but anyone in the country can use it and we're pretty excited about it when you're ready we'd love to see a demonstration excellent sure yeah great thank you kelly mm -hmm. you've always been our superstar oh thank you well, one of them we have many. We are a big team. So, uh, so as Barry said, we're going to just provide an overview. I'll try to remember to pause after kind of each topic area um, in case you want to, there's some conversation that you want to have about that specific, but I'm going to kind of move. There's three different topic areas. Um, additionally, at the very back of the presentation is a map. So if I reference a project that you're not familiar with, I created a, a location map, so it kind of gives you an idea of where that project was um, in the county. So we're gonna provide an, an, uh, some background. Um, it's gonna include those, those topic areas we're gonna cover, uh, kind of uh, in the policies that are currently on the books, uh, some history and, and current practices of those three program areas, current county policy and, and how we, and when we do our work, discussion on special assessments and that process and considerations um, that we take into account as we're, we're doing this work and these projects and programs, how other jurisdictions in the Tampa Bay region handle these issues, and then just an um, overview summary of, of what we've discussed in, this morning. So again, that background, um, we've obviously been receiving a lot of requests for additional levels of service in the program areas of stormwater management, specifically um, focused on those private systems that, that are failing, um, requests for navigational dredging for boat access, um, as, as well as aquatic plant management services. So those are the three areas I'm going to focus on. I'm going to start 
in that order and go in that order. I'm going to offer a little bit of history with regard to aquatic plant management because there is a lot of history there and I think the context is important. As far as uh, current policies and, and some of the code updates that have, have occurred more recently, uh, we have had a public lake improvement ordinance on our books since 1976. Um, it allows for the county to initiate programs for to manage aquatic growth, decay manner, and otherwise the cleaning and providing of maintenance for public lakes within the unincorporated area. Uh, the navigational dredging policy has, has been in place for, for quite some time. The most recent um, memo that we have that the county staff still rely on is from 2007. Uh, Lake Tarpon, the, the policy regarding aquatic plant management was most recently revisited in 2010. Of course, the surface water assessment was adopted in 2013, and that code does include a provision for um, <coughs> utilizing the kind of the special benefit in uniform assessment method approach uh, for projects beyond what we currently do. So there's a section of the code that could be utilized if we needed it uh, for, um, you know, say a drainage improvement project. If say like the penny for Pinellas, uh, you know, were not renewed, this would offer a mechanism to do that work. It would just be performed in it. The funding would be handled a different way. Um, the land development codes that uh, were updated last year included um, updates to chapter 110, which is the special assessment section of the code. It currently includes um, special assessments for drainage, as well as navigational dredging. There are also transportation-related assessments in there for you know, private um, roads and um, light, uh, street lighting districts. Um, there's also Chapter 138 that we rely on that, rely, that um, requires private development to maintain their private stormwater systems in accordance with those approved site plans. And then, of course, we have our, our Public Works Policies and Procedures Manual. Um, back, of, I think when I started here, that manual was called the Red Book, and it really, because it was a red book, it was a binder about yay thick, a red binder. Um, in modern days, we've, we've updated that manual as part of the <coughs> APWA accreditation process, and uh, that started in 2017, 2018, and then the most recent update is, has been this year. So starting with uh, public stormwater management, so where we do projects or maintenance um, when studies or our assessments confirm that removing that sediment will ultimately reduce flooding. And that is the core purpose. We implement these types of projects in creeks and canals where the county has rights and responsibilities. Uh, that picture on the top there is a recent um, project on the Cross Bayou Canal in the north section um, where we have cleared that area, um, allowing for water flow and improved water quality and environmental benefit. Um, and then Miles Creek, um, that is in, that is a tributary to Joe's Creek down in Millman. Um, and that is the spider at the bottom picture there doing um, clean out work in Miles Creek. And generally, um, projects of this magnitude can be, there are a variety of funding sources. For example, the Cross Bayou project was, was done with Penny for Pinellas dollars. Um, the Miles Creek project was done with a combination of surface water assessment and, and general funds. We also have other sources including grants and some transportation trusts in there as well. When we're looking at private stormwater management systems, so that gets into you know a development that has constructed a series of ponds, channels, swales, pipes, structures that are, that are wholly private, um, the public can come in and petition the county for what's called a special assessment to repair, restore, or replace their infrastructure. The most recent project that we have on the books was the Hidden Meadows Garland Drainage Improvement Project, and that is exactly what we did. It was a very large project done in 2003, and the funding for that project was paid for by the benefiting property owners within the community. So that is stormwater. I know that was a very brief overview before I jump to navigation. Here. Real quick question. On the previous slide, that um, piece of equipment you said is a spider. Is that what it's uh, it's the, the brand name is Kaiser. Um, the generic name for the type of, of, of equipment is spider because it can actually crawl down into the into the channel and do the work. Do we own that? Yes, we do. When did <laughs> when did we acquire? Uh, that in 2014. Yeah, 2014. Really? We bought it. Did you drive it? No. 
<laughs> where's, where's Barbara? I think that would be a good. <laughs> it is a prominent feature at the, um, you know, when we have uh, Sons and Daughters Day at Public Works. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a prominent feature. We also have it for the Leadership Academy because it does kind of look like a prehistoric dinosaur <laughs> kind of walking around. So it's a very versatile piece of equipment. It was the first one that we acquired when the surface water assessment passed because of channels and ditches and you can look at this one a traditional piece of equipment is going to have a challenge working in this area you've got a wall you've got a pipe but the, the spider can crawl down a bank and over the pipe with so it allows us to work in areas where we previously had challenges question real quick yes um you know in some areas and i was thinking back a little bit uh, when i was in, in Dunedin, some of the projects that we did there but um, there are, you know, obviously before we required stormwater uh, retention on properties uh, for private owners, uh, many times it would just be a, a, a cleaning of the of the parking lot and into the into the canal it would go. Uh, but it also was our areas of responsibility where we would just have streets that have you know collect sand and into the canals they would go. So. Um, I can think of a few right right offhand, but I don't know specifically as it relates to Lake Tarpon and those canals up there. There's a sense of responsibility of from private property owners and, and new development requirements. But also, how, how, how have we changed over time in terms of managing the stormwater runoff from our streets and that that might make it into the canal? How, how has that changed? Maybe that's for Raheem or... Uh, I don't, I, you know, whoever. Well, the, I mean, the, probably the biggest change came in 1985, you know, when the state started requiring stormwater, permitted stormwater management facilities for development. And that was, the, you know, the first, you know, really big change that impacted not only private development, but local government. We had to apply for those permits too. We had to meet the same criteria. Um, our code has also come along with that. Um, you know, we've had multiple updates to our land development code. Um, that required stormwater management best practices for development. Um, one of the things that, you know, I think is, is, you know, that we have really embraced is that, you know, our, we are required on county projects to meet the county code. And that's in our policies and procedure manual. So if we're requiring a private development to meet a particular criteria, we also meet that particular criteria on our projects. Um, that's, you know, one of the things that has changed through time beyond the regulatory. Um, we also were um, required to obtain a, initially a federal permit under the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System Program. Um, it regulates public stormwater systems, the MS4, Municipal Separate Stormwater System. Um, it regulates the things that we have to do, what we're required to do. Um, we're on cycle four of that permit right now. It renews every five years. That permit details all of our management requirements, how often we are to clean out our channels, how often we are to clean out our catch basins, how often you know we sweep our streets, we monitor water quality, we address impaired waters. So that that permit details you know all of our all of our requirements under both state law and the <coughs> Water Act. Okay. I appreciate it. And then just one other example and then move on on this, but I, you know, there was a project we had where it involved uh, Cedar Creek Basin in, in, in Dunedin, and we had we had some the runoff issues, and, and so the canals were, you know, being filled up in front of folks' homes. It's kind of the, on the downstream side, and we said that we were going to go in and not, not only clean out the upstream, but also provide some major retention so that when the water flowed, Actually, there were some catch basins where we'd go in and clean up afterwards. And once we did that, we said that the idea would be we'll go clean out the dredge one time, but then we feel like we have done our public responsibility to mitigate future problems. And from then on, it would be the homeowner's responsibility. That was kind of the message going in. And then when it came time to vote, it didn't happen that way. But we backed away from what I, I considered a promise to those residents. But so the, the idea was is that we fixed it, let's go dredge it, and now it's yours because we've done our public policy. So I just throw that out as a, you know, because I think in that particular area of Lake Tarpon and those canals, we've just done a lot of improvements to the streets up there. And I don't know how 
the, the runoff is changed after the project and before the project, but I would suggest that probably a lot of the public areas have contributed to those dredging issues in the canals. Just a I, you know, question, so. Are we? Okay. Is Cedar Creek connected to Curly Creek? No. Okay. It's completely separate basin. Because it's stand we did do the improvements on Curly Creek. It's a different one. And I, so my question is, as I recall, some of it was the city of Dunedin's responsibility. Correct. Did they ever move forward? Uh, I can tell you that they did some, but I don't think they did all of what they did. And most of the problems that we had back on Cedar Creek, when, it, when you cut through everything, it wasn't whether they felt it was, it was cost driven. It was, it was just too expensive. But yet, it was not too expensive to ask our residents to pick up the tab on their. So I just think there was a kind of a different issue. But you're right, over on Curlew Creek, it was like county, city of Clearwater, city of Dunedin. And in fact, I think there was even an FDOT piece with a, a retention along Curlew, uh, Curlew Ave, Curlew Ave, yeah, right there on the side there. So it was a multiple. I don't know how, I don't know where they are or how far they've gotten on that project, but there's still work to be done. I'm actually going to talk about that Curlew Chandley project as an example. Um, and I'll bring up some of the, you know, some of the considerations with regard to um, when you do something like that, what type of risks or liabilities you might be assuming. So that's a little later on and we can jump Thank back you. in on that conversation. So um, looking ahead to navigational dredging. So I'm going to start, you know, with coastal management and you're all very familiar with this program. Um, essentially, you know, we have a federal authorization up and down in San Key and uh, we nourish uh, working with the Army Corps of Engineers where we have erosion control lines set that kind of dictates our work template. You know, so for example, our next project or upcoming project is um, on St. Key Beach. Um, down at uh, you know, Paso Grill, and um, we nourish there. The federal authorization extends down that far, and we have an erosion control line that we have to have in order to nourish. Um, different from Madeira Beach, we don't we don't nourish Madeira Beach because we do not have an erosion control line set. Um, Madeira Beach benefits from the beaches north of it. They receive sand, They're, so they, their beach then tends to stay nice and wide, uh, so they don't have the same challenges as some of our more erosional beaches. So the, the, some of the federal and state programs kind of dictate where and when you work in the coastal program. So this is an example of a, a project that just occurred where we dredge sand, the Army Corps dredge sand from Blind Pass, and then we beneficially reuse that material on up a beach. And you know this is a, a great program, and we do this in multiple areas around the county where we have approved borrow areas. So we're able to both maintain navigation within a, a, a large canal channel that the boating public and commercial users uh, benefit from, and we're also able to protect um, our beach, our private and public infrastructure, um, environmental benefits, and of course tourism. Typically, our funding sources break out to you know about. 60% federal and then the county and the state typically split the remainder, 20% each. Um, that can vary, uh, but that's generally the rule of thumb. Um, when we're looking at other canals and channels, the other public pass that, that the county maintains is Hurricane Pass. Um, the Army Corps uh, did not consider Hurricane Pass to meet certain criteria with regard to as a commercial pass. And so it does provide a general benefit to the boating public. It's heavily used. Um, it's a you know, great access to the Gulf of Mexico. And the last time we actually maintained that pass was in 2000. Uh, the funding came from our tourist development tax uh, through the bed tax. And the material was beneficially reused on the Dunedin Causeway on the beach. Yeah. Um, a private example would be McKay Creek. And that's that lower picture uh, kind of off of Indian Rocks Road, right where the creek enters the, the intracoastal waterway. Um, the board approved a, a special assessment project for that area in 2000, you know, 1990, excuse me, 1990. And, um, you know, the, the special uh, um, special assessment was placed on the properties that, that benefited, benefited from that infection. I think the last one was 2001, but we've done it before. So there's the first time we did it was in 1990, and I think there's not a second one. So um, the 
county did not fund this one. This one was, again, it was a navigational dredge for the boating public. So just back on navigational dredging, is there any questions on this one? I think the big thing here is we've we've, we've seen this now all, all around and the, the public are confused in terms of everybody wants us to dredge the sand, right? And so where where it's a main channel, um, that's where either the core or us have that responsibility. If it's, if it's benefiting just property owners, it's an access to their homes, those those are not. And that's the private versus the public. So those areas are defined. And, um, and that Kelly went through and showed me a lot of different examples of, of different areas. There's a lot of different examples. Is that defined by us or is that defined in state? Um, the, the federal channels are, are clearly defined, you know, there. Um, we have a map um, of all of the federal channels that they maintain, um, which includes, for example, you know, Blind Pass, um, the Intercoastal Waterway Channel is a federal channel. Um, the dredge project that's going to be upcoming in the Inkwell River is a federal channel. Um, the only county channel that we formally maintain is um, Hurricane Pass. Um, so that's that's the only one that we... And that's for, the reason I brought it up is because that is always a question, right? And, and how, how did we get this and not this or that, you know? So I just wanted to so put that, how did put we that get up that? there. How did we get that and not? That's right. That's right. I, want, I want Kelly to address that. How, how did we get one county channel? What, what, what facilitated us uh, getting one county channel? You know, uh, based on the board documents that I was that I looked at, basically what happened was um, the Corps made a determination that this was not a channel that they would take responsibility for. They have a very specific set of criteria for channels that they will operate and maintain, and it has to do a lot, uh, not just with recreational boating, but with commercial access. And Hurricane Pass did not meet the federal criteria for that. So at that time, the board that was in place um, elected to take responsibility for maintaining Hurricane Pass to provide that boating access. It is a widely used channel by the, recreation, the recreational boaters. Um, we get a lot of requests on it. It is a shifting channel. We have to move navigational markers very frequently. Um, but it is it, there is a greater public purpose to maintaining that channel because it is of such regional significance. Compared to, say, for example, McKay Creek here, um, where the benefit is to those individuals trying to get their boat out into the Intercoastal Waterway. The Intercoastal Waterway maintained by Army Corps. Um, but in this particular case, it's a that navigational benefit was to them and them only. So, would the Grand Canal be something that you would say is not a benefit to the general population, or not? Under current county policy, my professional opinion would be that it would be um, a benefit to the properties in and around the Grand Canal. But the uh, general population uses that channel to recreate, to go to restaurants and stuff like that. So it isn't only the residents that live right there that benefit from that. It would be a much larger population that benefits from that. Um, and as fast as that's closing, I've got real concern on that. So it would be a board decision if we were to adopt something like that? It would be a board decision. And, and it would obviously be precedent second for other areas. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to kind of put these out there because our, because my question to Kelly is, OK, if we took it, we take that position on this one, how many other situations are like that? Right, right but we already made a precedent. Well, we, we did for one, um, yeah. okay, and, and they consider that a channel rather than a canal that has a defined property than an entity in the back. Right? Since they're doing silent titles, is that what that's called? Silent titles, is that quiet titles? What you call it? Quiet title. Quiet titles. So since all the residents there are doing quiet titles so that their property extends to where the sand ends, if, 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 we, if we choose not to, then they will own all of that until it crosses over, and then that will never be able to be open because we can't do harm. Correct. So I'm um, correct. <laughs> the I mean the entire you know there is a time in which intervention is possible because right now the sand that's below the mean high water line belongs to the state. Right. So. But know, as but as quickly as that sand is coming above the water line, and as quickly as it's filling in that canal, 
and they're doing the quiet titles. So they're now owning all the way up to the water. Is and as more sand water? piles on, they're going to continue to own up to the water. So at some point, we can do no harm to their new property. Correct? Without, um, you know, we have attorneys in the office, but, you know, there's discussion about if, you know, we were to do a project that then impacted private property regarding taking and claims and wants to weigh in on that but yes there's you know a concern that um and we're, we're we are still marching through the project um as a matter of fact yesterday the meeting with the regulatory agencies occurred so we're trying to you kind of bring the that's the, all that information the, the into rest. recommendations that yeah i just yeah, I, and bring, i understand to all that the, to bring the, the rest of the board up to you know speak on, well and on I, that that's project. kind of my point is you to know. bring it up because i think it's really so so down with the Grand Canal, the, one of the major questions has been what's causing the, the sand to kind of fill up, and then what, what channels would be best to open that area up, and, and, and then how long would that occur? And there's been several different yeah. um, ideas, and the residents hired their expert, we had our expert, and we've been kind of forcing them to sit down at a table and, and have a discussion about what, you know, what are the options. You know, regardless of how it's paid for, uh, just saying what are what are the scientific options to um, to consider, and so that's been occurring. And I think they Kelly posted a meeting here not too long ago that I think they found they found a lot of common ground um, in terms of that it, it wasn't it's not all of our beach nourishment that's causing it. It's that it's contributes, but that's not the main driver. Um, and so so that that's. That's what that discussion is going on. We haven't come to a conclusion. We haven't. We don't have a recommendation. We don't have a funding option. They've just been trying to get at the scientific approach to maintaining that area. And we had some, you know, to, to add on to Barry's discussion. We obviously, as things have been working out there, we had to reach out to the State Department of Lands to give us title determination: who owns what out there. And so. Some things came out that we were not aware of. We thought certain areas were owned by the state. It now turns out that they're in private ownership um, because of accretion laws. And so it does change anything that we could propose coming forward, um, making sure that we're staying off of private property. Um, as the private property owners have made it clear that they are um, of their position not to have any impacts to their property. So, so what I'm hearing is that the individual owners are getting quiet title to the yeah. further out we have a lot that, of those that in, even more you know, right now property um, issue. where so yeah so um, you call right? it road so, one yeah. property owner has has um filed a quiet title over that accretion yes so the only reason i bring it up and the staff did a great job i'm not they did a really good job and for the first time the chair of the community was actually not angry no, that's a big deal that's a really big deal um but the reason i bring it up is because to me the the rate of that sand accumulating is ex exponentially increased over the last three years and the more they do that quiet title the the less options we have and so the reason i'm bringing it up is because i think it's something that is very time sensitive and if we don't make a decision and i know it's a big decision but even in the plan that was kind of done, the Grand Canal was really not looked at to the degree in which I think it should. And if that Grand Canal closes, that's a really big deal to to anyone really in South County that uses Bunces Pass or Shell Key because many people go up that channel to eat restaurants at the, at the restaurants up in there, Billy's and all the other restaurants. And so it's not just the neighborhood thing like the creek. The creek, there's no place to go that's public, right? But in the Grand Canal, there's a ton of places to go that are public. But they would be contributing also. But and let's let's hold that. Let's get yeah. through that because the the uh, that's kind of this general discussion, right? Because um, we've got these sand issues down right. here. We've got property owners that feel we have a responsibility up, or, you know, around Lake Tarpon and stuff. And again, we're not um, opposed to any of these, but there's a cost and there's a precedent. One thing we want to be is consistent. Um, you know, and how we apply that, and we got to have a way of paying for it, you know. And so, um, that's what today's about is to kind of put all these issues out on the table and bring the entire board into that discussion. Um, so, this one's going to, we, we get it's time sensitive. I am thrilled 
that they were able from yeah. the last meeting when I got accosted down there by very angry people um, that they were able to find common ground yeah. to this I mean they're like telling me and I'm like okay guys you can talk to me all day long I got to go to the, <laughs> the scientist here I mean you know that's that's got there's got to be a technical solution I get two experts that have differing opinions they now agree that's a huge movement you know on that project so now we can they can bring that home after they get some of these uh, land right issues and the legal determinations now they can bring it home to where we can do get to a discussion so i do believe they're going to bring that in a timely manner to where we can we can make a decision on that um and it's the same way we've got you know these other ones that's the reason we've been working on, on putting this presentation together because it's complicated and it's all over the county there's a lot of these things Madam Chair, so I would even bring up the, uh, maybe Kelly can address this, but the intercoastal waterway, the entire intercoastal waterway, hasn't that been going in over time? Yes, and we've actually brought up um, some areas of them, especially in the north part of the intercoastal waterway, um, when the Army Corps, every now and again, they'll put out a request for projects, and that one was high on our list. It also was high on the list with the Clearwater and Dunedin, because it appears that that's, that northern portion is shoaling more than the southern portion. Um, so I, think it's, we, I know we brought it up. We continue to bring it up. Um, you know, for the Corps, it is their management area. It's their management responsibility. So. Do we have the possibility of ever getting federal funding for that? Mm -hmm. I mean, is well, that, that a federal, federal waterway per se? That is a federally managed channel, so it would be a, it would be a core project 100%. It would be not, it would not be like our beach project. Madam Chair, could I just ask one question before we get off of this particular subject? Yeah. Kelly, is the staff has the staff moved far along in looking at these issues that? They are ready to come to you you're not in a place where you can come to us with any recommendations correct are you specifically talking about um shell key grains now yeah um we're having the next meeting is is set i i um I sent an invitation to all of you it's for november 13th and that is the meeting where we will be presenting to the public all of the options that have worked through the process um with costs and potential options for funding, how that might look um, after we meet with the public and get their initial in input on that on that presentation on our final results. Um, that report will be finalized, and then we do have in our contract with our consultant to come to the board for a, a formal presentation after that after that community meeting number two. Good, and I just have one for where. I'm sorry. Where this is where. For the Grand Canal area that she's just been talking about, but I have one more follow-up if I might, and then we'll move on. Um, in your presentation this morning, are you also going to talk about Lake Seminole and talk, um, the issues that we had in Tarpon Springs, getting the ships in and out of that? Um, not Anclo per se, but I mean we can we can discuss Anclo, um, but definitely Lake Seminole and Lake Tarpon are next. Um, one other thing to Barry's point about precedent, um, I failed to um, state back with, you know, regard to private stormwater systems, just to give you an order of magnitude, we're, we're kind of going through an effort in GIS to kind of map where all these private systems are. And, you know, right now we've, we've hit 5,000. 5,000? So there's five, well, oh. at a minimum, okay, 5,000 <clears throat> private stormwater ponds and systems, so it's not just the pond, obviously the water has to get to the pond, so you're talking about channels and, and ditches and swales and pipes and structures that ultimately get there. And so, just giving you an order of magnitude when you know folks come in and request these services for something that is in the code that was part of their development responsibility, there's, you know, if we were to go down that road to precedent, there may be 5,000 more in the queue. And so just, things that we need to keep in mind and we will I have a, a whole slide on considerations and it'll, it'll probably stimulate a lot of conversation about about that type of, <coughs> of thought and what we need to do just to give you an order of magnitude of what you're paying for right now it's less than a thousand so our county budget right now is our permanent facilities yeah. just focusing on our stormwater ponds and uh, similar types of facilities we're about 700 um, so the county's budget right now pays for 700. 
If you were to go to 5,000, they will give you a range of how much more money you need to do that. Just give it a perspective. So the source for that, the thousand that we maintain, what's the funding source from the county? If it's in the unincorporated area, the surface water assessment pays for it. If it's associated with like McMullen Booth Road, it may be general fund or some transportation trust. For Hurricane Pass, is that an ongoing maintenance expense? Uh, we do a bathymetric survey um, pretty much annually to measure the, the depth of the channel and the migration of the channel. Um, this year, um, the bathymetric survey showed that the water depth is, is very deep. There's not a, an issue, but we did need to relocate the navigational channels and make sure people were staying where we wanted them to stay. So how much have we spent on that since 2000? Can you give us that number? Um, that, I can get you the number for that project. Okay. We, uh, other than just maintenance of Hates navigation, we haven't nourished. And that's all to be all bed tags? Yes. Okay. Again, that material is beneficially reused on the Dunedin Causeway of each area, so. Uh, mm -hmm. Question. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I, because I, I, the question that, that uh, the commissioner asked about about Lake Tark, or not Lake Tark, but Bank Club River, uh, and, and to me, that is an issue that needs to be on the table as well. I didn't know. I want to make sure that I heard you just say, yeah, that's something that we can look at. But uh, to me, the, the, one of the things that concerns me is that that, that you know wherever there's dredging done. If, if the abutting areas aren't done at the same time, the, the th everything that you've done can be uh, damaged, so to speak. So one of the areas down in, 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 Lake, in the enclosure is that there's an area that needs to be done at the same time. And if it's not done at the same time, the work that's done there, will, the silt will move. And that first brings me to the topic of silt movement, you know, and, and to me, <laughs> it's, it, yeah, there's a mother nature piece to that. So when you look at all these projects along the coast, in and around the coast for navigation or on lakes, on the lakes and things like that, are we able to kind of also assess scientifically what is subject to natural ebb and flow of, of you know, you know the, the waters that come in or environmental aspects that happen, storms that come in? It, there's only so much control you have with that because we could do we could fix everything tomorrow let's just say and then something happens and a bunch of sediment comes in and fills it but there's a natural kind of ebb and flow of that versus some other areas that don't, that don't have that so when you look at a project you say this area is not subject to that so if we fix the problem right now it's 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 good money versus if we go over here and do it next month it could be it could change with a major storm that comes in and has sediment movement so just not thoughts now, but just that kind of thinking about that. And then um, this 5,000 thing that you're talking about, are you talking about ponds across the county? We've, yeah, we've, um, we've mapped out 5,000 private retention systems okay. within the okay, county. Okay, so that, that's not canal-based stuff that we're talking about now. We're just talking about pond issues around the... Yeah, so okay. for example, you know, like I was talking about... Um, you know this particular project so if they came in they they petitioned the county for a special assessment to um, basically replace their entire stormwater management system which included pipes included structures included ponds it was very extensive but if if the county were to say want to take on that we could be looking at five thousand plus I got and it. that's where it's i got it. I just want to make sure that that was separated from this discussion about navigational dredging yeah. We don't have 5,000 navigational dredging projects. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, so as I mentioned on the aquatic vegetation, I'm going to provide a little bit of history because it, 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 it provides an important context. Um, the, these lakes have been through, you know, we've, we've been dealing with them for many, many years, and, and there's a lot of history there. So just, just focusing on aquatic plant management history in Lake Seminole, in the 1990s, early 1990s and, and 2000s, invasive plants were a significant challenge. And I know that you know Commissioner Seal will definitely remember. Commissioner Welsh may also remember that you know Lake Seminole was so covered in hydrilla that it appeared that you could walk across the surface. And that drove a, a citizen outcry. It, it, you know the Lake Seminole Advisory Committee, the LSAC, came out of that. Partnerships with the Water Management District, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission. 
the city of Seminole, the city of Largo, all came together to you know, develop a diagnostic feasibility study, try to understand what was going on, that ultimately culminated in the watershed management plan that was finished in 2001. And, and the ultimate goal that came out of that with regard to vegetation was to manage those nuisance species to the lowest feasible level and encourage the establishment of beneficial plants that provide water quality benefit and then habitat. So these pictures is just an example. This is the east side of the lake. It's adjacent to the park. And that, that picture on the top is an area what we call a tussock. And it basically is some really unbeneficial sediments. And then there's a bunch of invasive plants growing on top of it. Um, I had an experience out there with one of the Fish Commission scientists who tried to walk out on it and fell through. Oh my uh, goodness. Yes, <laughs> up to here and he's six feet tall. So it, it, they're basically floating map islands, but they don't really go anywhere. Um, in this particular case, this was a, a partnership with the Water Management District and the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission. We cordoned off the area with water dams that were about eight feet high. We pumped that area out. We scraped it down. We reflooded it. And then we, the, the Fish Commission came in and replanted it with beneficial plants. And, and that's the picture today. And so now we manage to this level. So we went through over the years doing a lot of harvesting, a lot of projects like this to remove those vegetation, those, those uh, vegetation that were causing the problems. And now we're in what we call preventative mode. Let's not let the lake go backwards. Let's ensure that we're managing protectively and proactively um, to benefit water quality, habitat, and, and make sure that we don't slide back to where we have to do that really big effort. So there's a real strong on managing those restored areas. On Lake Seminole, uh, the private parcels and, and canals are maintained by the property owners. So there's a lot of private land on Lake Seminole. Um, we also maintain, we have a lot of county-owned land on Lake Seminole. We maintain that. You know. We do maintain the entire lake, including all the private areas, for what I'm going to call the Big Three. And I'm going to use this term a lot because it, it, it comes across a lot. So Big Three are hydrilla, water hyacinth, and water lettuce. And the reason why we do that um, is because their growth rate is exponential and once they get a stronghold it is next to impossible to stop it and so the state the state has come out and, and basically said you know that best practice is really to you know take control of those big three make sure they don't spread beyond where they should and that is a, a, a public benefit so we do that only so those three I'm sorry hydrilla water hyacinth water lettuce and hydrilla those are considered the three most invasive species when according you know for plot plant management. So does the city of Largo and the city of Seminole contribute to the cost of that? They do not. Um do you know why? I do not. I do know that the board passed a resolution and I cannot remember the number but um to kind of lead the efforts on Lake Seminole, I can go back and find that. I know it's in my files. Um, I'm okay with leading it, but that doesn't mean that I'll have to contribute. Yeah, so. Okay. Um, private interests do maintain vegetation on, you know, in county area, elm areas, and state-owned areas if they have structure. So, for example, there's an area of Lake Seminole along Harborside Drive where the property owners have docks. And they will, apply for an aquatic plant management permit to maintain their navigability right at their dock. That's not some, that's not a service that the county provides. But they, they do that on their own. Um, now if it's hydrilla, water hyacinth, or water lettuce, yes, we will come in and take care of that for the greater good. And then the funding for the county efforts, again, it's a combination of surface water assessment and general fund. Um, and as you know, Commissioner Peters noted, because some of the areas are in Lake, are in the city of Seminole, and the city of Largo, um, that's, those are not areas where we can apply the surface water assessment dollars. All right, so Lake Tarpon is a little different. All right, so Lake Tarpon was designated a surface water improvement program water body by the state of Florida. Um, the first swim plan was adopted in 1989, and that essentially set out the goals for the lake. You know, what do we, what do we need to achieve to ensure this lake stays healthy and meet swim criteria. Um, in between the swim plan um, in 1998, the county, the water management district, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission worked together to develop a more comprehensive plan that says, okay, you've got these goals, now how do we get there? Essentially the same goal for aquatic plant management 
um, came out of that work um, is like seminal. Manage to the invasive to great system practical, and then um, encourage beneficial plans. However, in between that swim plan and that watershed plan, um, interim actions were needed to address you know, chronic hydrilla and cattail problems um, that were ongoing in the lake. In 1993, the county and the Water Management District entered into an agreement. Uh, the agreement provided for the purchase of a harvester. Um, the county would operate that harvester, not only on Lake Tarkin, but also on Lake Seminole, um, to meet some of those goals. This was never intended to be a long-term agreement. It was in place from 1993 to 1994. Then it had two two-year extensions um, expiring in 1998. Um, my records indicate that we didn't exercise the last two-year agreement, so it officially expired in 96. The agreement, um, basically the water management district would be the lead on the lake proper, so they would manage the big three that I've talked about before. Um, and then the county agreed to harvest cattails in a 10-foot wide path down the center of the canals on Lake Tarpon and treat for hydrilla because it was also problematic. And then private residents were responsible for management of vegetation around their docks and any other private structures they had in those canals. So, so just real quick for clarity, I want to make sure. So that when you, when you, we do, according to this, it says that at that point we were going into the canals to harvest cattails <coughs> in a 10 foot wide path uh, and, and treat for hydrilla. So that was our responsibility. We, we took on that responsibility. That's that what point. we agreed to as part of that agreement. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay thanks. Yes, with a time, sir. All right, so in 2010, um, obviously they're going through <clears throat> the recession and there was, we were looking for cost savings opportunities for various county functions. And this one came up for conversation as to why are we still doing this? Um, so in 2010, a decision was made to notify the residents that the aquatic plant management program that the county provided would be discontinued but the water management district would continue treating for hydrilla, the big three, hydrilla, water lettuce, water hyacinth. So that service would not be dropped, but the county service of, of maintaining cattails um, and hydrilla would not go forward. Having said that, you, know, you can see from this picture, by 2010, the cattail issue was pretty much eradicated and we weren't really doing much harvesting anymore. So essentially you're dealing with hydrilla. And that issue is, is still being maintained, so, so nobody lost service that's related to that. Um, pro however, the property owners were responsible for management related, again, to their private navigation and aesthetic issues. Currently, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission has assumed responsibility from the Water Management District, so that's a transition that we're still um, kind of getting grasping with and, and who our new contacts are. Um, they're targeting the same species, so the same big three, lake-wide, including canals. The work will be conducted by a private contractor, and then canals, <coughs> manage, again, or navigation and aesthetics issues will be handled by the residents that are benefiting from that service. And I just thought it was interesting that the Visit Florida magazine has Lake Tarpon listed as the Jewel of Pinellas and one of the top ten bass fishing lakes in the state, so I thought I'd wow. throw that in there. As, <laughs> Have you have you heard that? I didn't. So I, that's great. So I mean, the lake is very healthy. It's a it's a beautiful lake if you haven't been out there, um, and it's on the state radar. Uh, Kelly, yes. Boy, thank you for that last comment because uh, you know we get mixed messages from folks that live along there that say that there's a lot of problems on the lake in terms of navigating up there. Or their motors get caught up in a lot of the I guess <coughs> some of the species that are out there. So. Um, uh, unfortunately, I didn't reach out soon enough, but I tried to contact the uh, Chief Jameson, who has a, a, a boat out on the canal, and I'm assuming that they frequently go out there and see, you know, just to, because of their calling, um, and wonder what kind of feedback we got from them from an accessibility issue standpoint or anything else. So I haven't heard back from them yet, but you're, you're pretty comfortable that the, the health of the lake is what you would consider good, too. Um, yeah, well, we, uh, you know, from a... From a state perspective, when they do their assessment, water quality must meet 
this is the line, and if you go above the line, you're not meeting. If you're below the line, you're fine. Lake tarpon, um, one parameter is considered too high. And um, the nitrogen and phosphorus are very good, but the chlorophyll, measure of algae growth, is too high. Um, because Lake Tarpon is not a natural freshwater lake, it was brackish, um, one of the tools in the toolbox to figure out what water quality was, so this kind of goes to Commissioner Eggers' question about history, where sediment came from, is to do what's called, and I'm sorry for this term, paleolinology study. And we have completed that. It just rolls sorry. off your tongue. <laughs> sorry, I know. Um, but essentially what that, what that entails is taking very deep cores in the bottom of the lake and looking at the age of those sediments going back to when Lake Tarpon was actually brackish, salt water, and saying what was the water quality then? And we can do that from those sediments and the algae that you find in those sediments. And basically that study essentially showed that the quality of the water in Lake Tarpon before it was actually a freshwater lake and what it is now are essentially the same. So Lake Tarpon is doing very well. So Madam Chair. So Kelly. I didn't hear you talk about that piece of the lake when you were talking about Lake Seminole. What's the water quality like at Lake Seminole? Because they don't have the same designation from the state that Lake Tarpon does, right? No. Um, primarily because Lake Tarpon is in the Tampa Bay watershed. So that's how it got the swim designation where Lake Seminole is not. Um, the water quality in Lake Seminole is, is still not good. It is better than it was years ago, but it's trending well. Um, the trend is going in the right direction, that's what we want to see. So it's telling us that our management actions are having an impact. Obviously, we're getting ready to dredge here um, before the end of this month. The dredge will be on the water and we'll be removing the material from the lake. So that's nearly a million cubic yards of very organic rich sediment sitting on the bottom of the lake. And the bottom line is if we don't get that out, it really doesn't matter what other small water improvements we do, the water quality will never truly improve. Um, just to the same type of discussion as to what do we know about that sediment, um, we had to do extensive surveys of that sediment in order to even obtain permits to do the work. And one thing that we learned that was I, I thought was very interesting, at least from a scientific perspective, was that just over 80% of the sediment that is in Lake Seminole was there before it was a lake. No kidding. Correct. So 80% was there? Yes. It was their estuary sediments from when it was an estuary before it was flooded. So, so it was a it was salt marsh, it was mangroves, it was it was an estuary tidal system. And when the park boulevard was constructed and the dam structure was installed in the 40s, Essentially, we flooded all that material and just let it sink to the bottom of the lake. When you overlay the map of the sediment that we're going to be removing with the historic channel of the tidal system, it matches perfectly. That is fascinating. It is. So, uh, so that brings me to a well, because I actually have the t-shirt that says I walked on the bottom of Lake Seminole. I have pictures of you doing it. <laughs> so that brings me to a thing I was thinking about as I'm hearing about all of the things going on on Lake Seminole. And since the initial stages of when they first started that project, technology has advanced quite a bit, I'm learning. And so I'm curious about how we could take what we're doing now and just with a few tweaks maybe remove the heavy concentration of phosphates that are in the water which would clean the water and return the water to the lake in a nice more pristine quality would that well, be possible the the sediment that we're removing you know has phosphorus in it obviously but it also has a lot of nitrogen and so by physically removing it, we're removing both. Now, um, like I said, the dredge project is just getting ready to kick off. I know we've got Commissioner Justice scheduled for a little trip next week to take a peek at, peek at the area. So um, basically what's going to happen is that material is going to be uh, hydraulically dredged off the bottom of the lake. It's going to go through a water treatment system where it will be um, injected with these polymers that separate out the phosphorus and the nitrogen so that it settles down 
That material will then go into the dredge material management area. The soft organic material that is combined with polymer will sink to the bottom. As it moves through the system, the sand will stop right at, right at the initiation because it's very heavy, so it'll drop out there. And so we are using a water quality treatment technology as part of this process so oh, that good. when that water leaves the dredge material management area, it has to go back to the lake. So it has to be clean. And so we have to ensure that that water meets standards. We have to sample it regularly. It's part of our permit. So we will be making sure that as the water comes back to the lake from that process, it is better than it was. That's it great. In. And I would really appreciate it, Barry, if you or the staff could connect with folks in Seminole and Largo. And I mean, I'm sure they know what we're doing out there. They ought to be picking up a piece of it. I agree with what Commissioner uh, Peters was suggesting that, you know, I don't know why we are taking on the entire cost. It should be a partnership, I think. I just want to remind the board, um, over the last year, couple of years, we've made a lot of investments in cleaning up the lake that result, both lakes, that resulted from some of these plans that Kelly brought up. So I just want to remind the constructed out treatment facilities to clean the stuff coming in. We did in basement improvements. Uh, for Lake Seminole, the last major improvement was now that we've cleaned most of the stuff from coming that comes in. Like seven old judge was that last step, and now let's get the stuff that's in there out of the system. And that was part of our permitting requirements, actually. That was one of the very first questions the state asked was, you know, if you don't clean up what's coming in first, it's just going to go downhill again. So what have you done? And it's like, oh, well, we have the Soil Watershed Management Plan. We have all of these regional stormwater treatment facilities that we've constructed are in operation. We implemented all of the habitat restoration requirements, the scraping of those areas. We we harvested those areas that were recommended for harvesting. Now we're in management mode and operational mode on the stormwater systems, and they're like, wow, that is truly a watershed-based approach. That's what they're looking for, and that's how we've been moving that way. So work from the watershed in. And Largo did participate in the Allen treatment. Oh, they did? Yeah, way back. I don't know what they've been doing lately. Um, just back to the target real quick. You had talked about certain, certain uh, test results that showed the lake to be in good condition with high, I think you said hydrogen and phosphorus? Nitrogen and phosphorus. Nitrogen, nitrogen and phosphorus are, are fine. You know, they meet the state water quality standards. But the chlorophyll is basically a measure of the algae in the water is considered to be too high. But again, when you're dealing with a lake that wasn't a lake, you have to ask more questions. And so Lake Seminole and Lake Tarpon are difficult to manage because they were not lakes in the first place. And so trying to force them to be like Lake Estopoga or one of those natural lakes around the state is kind of apples and oranges. You have to manage them differently. So the, the, that last part that you say that we're not doing too well at the chlorophyll part, does that add to some of the vegetative growth potential or is that a, a different measurement? I mean, We actually do a lake vegetation index out on the lake um, and what that is for is a, is a assessment of the quality of the vegetation out there for environmental pieces. And it's a state program. We have to be certified to do it. Um, and we haven't really seen uh, too much change. We are expecting a report. We hired the University of South Florida. They have a, a new, have new technologies, a new method of mapping submerged vegetation so that we can get an idea of, of coverage because Lake Tarpon is so big. Um, so we're, we're expecting a report on that very soon. Um, so they map that all out for us, and, and those results will. Be but when it comes money. to those three that you that you mentioned, the hydrilla, the cattail, and I don't know, the other uh, water, water lettuce, water hyacinths, those the the swift swift mud or whoever the uh, state organization is responsible for that in on Lake Tarpon. Yes. And do they include the the, the canals without those three items? Yes. Okay. So if, if there's ever, honestly, if there is ever somebody, you know, that's why we, we really try to help um, citizens recognize them. Um, hydrilla can be difficult. There are a few things that look like it, but if you feel it, it's very different than any other plant. Water lettuce and water hyacinth are very easy to recognize. Water lettuce looks like cabbage. Yeah. Water hyacinth has a big purple 
flower that grows out of it. Everybody thinks they're beautiful, but they're very problematic. Um, so we can, we want people to know what it looks like so that as soon as they see it, they can call it in because, you know, getting that under control when it's, you know, a 10 by 10 area is easy, but in two weeks, that 10 by 10 area will be 100 by 100 easily. So, so on this stuff, there, dredging is one issue, and then this, this, this growth is another issue, and there may be something else that's growing that they don't cover, that the state doesn't cover. Correct. So if it were like a native species, I know like right now, there's a, a species called pondweed, Illinois pondweed. It's a native in Florida. It's growing. It's, it has a good stronghold in, in Lake Seminole. It's great for water quality, great for bass fishing habitat, but it can cause people it gets tied up in their motors. If that were growing in their canal and it was causing them a navigation issue, they would be responsible for getting a permit to handle that because it's not an invasive, it's a beneficial plant, yeah. and the only reason to remove it would be before navigation. And the state would still take care of that out in the lake, or uh, not? They wouldn't even touch that, probably. Not, in, again, there may be a reason um, to do that if it were, say, impacting one of the boat ramps in and out and do mi as minimal management as possible just to keep it out of the main right. out of the main programs but thanks Bill. i have the feeling there's a very complicated flow chart of <laughs> question this and then this and then this and then yeah. to get to the questions you're asking yeah. mm -hmm. so i have a i have a question for you and it's not associated with these two lakes but i'm curious does the process take arsenic out and the reason i'm asking is because a constituent came to me and evidently back when it was Governor Bush in office, the city of St. Petersburg. You know what I'm talking about? I have city? actually have that in the slide. Okay, so yep. so I'm real concerned about that because they, they put that soil filled with arsenic at really high levels on Georgia. On a private, it's on private land now, so. Um, well, on the documents I have, that's not what it says. Okay, it, well, I'm not sure if, if that land has been sold, but there's a lawsuit. Right now. Well, there's there's at least one. I don't know if Jay Lee knows about it, but it also states in the DEP document that I have that it was placed in Toy Town. So, um, but but does our process take arsenic out if in fact arsenic is in our water? Um, we arsenic has been so in order to do a project of the magnitude like well any dredge project, you have to go through extensive sediment surveys. Okay, and so we basically had to sediment sample every single area that we were proposing to remove sediment multiple times. Um, the only area where we found any arsenic was in the south part of the lake adjacent to Park Boulevard. And it's at levels just above the residential threshold. It doesn't even come close to, to um, commercial. And so that area has to be specially managed for our permit. Um, it'll be inside the dredge material management area, so it will never go anywhere. It'll stay on public lands. It will not create a public problem the way this this issue did, but it, it, again, it's not at the levels that they were they found in Lake Lavore. It is just one area. So basically, we're going to dredge that area last, so that you know. Hopefully, I get the opportunity to take you all out there so you can get an order of magnitude. This dredge material management area is about 30 feet high, um, and so that the area that had some arsenic in it will be about, I think at the end of the day, five feet below grade at the top. So it will be within the dredge material management area within Lake Seminole Park, managed by the Mills County. All right, so obviously we've been having all this conversation about current public policy. So I don't, this is generally where we are, is that requirement for that underlying public purpose. Um, rights or responsibilities to fund or participate in any work on private property and mentioned that we would bring up Curlew Creek because that's a great example um, where you know, Curlew Creek Channel A has a contributing area of over 1,500 acres um, and then two additional tributaries actually drain into um, Channel A. So it serves a huge area and flood control projects on this channel have the ability to influence a greater area. So there was a great public benefit in doing this project, even though the area that we did it was actually private. We obtained 
the rights and responsibilities for that project through easements. Um, and now we've taken on the future management and maintenance responsibility for that project area. So that's kind of the top picture there. As you can see, that home is teetering on the edge of the creek bank. Um, and then the bottom picture is kind of what it looked like, part of the project area, what it looks like when it was restored and constructed. Again, there was a great public benefit to that project beyond, beyond um, Doral Mobile Home Park. Um, another public example, I mentioned the, the top three invasive species. We actually manage five lakes in the county um, for those top three because of that overarching public benefit. On the private side, um, the Seahorse Mobile Home Park in Park Nep Neves, second edition, navigational dredge is one of the more recent examples besides the Cape Creek. Um, and again, that was funded, that was that was deemed to really not be in the public interest. It's a dredge project that just benefited those, those homeowners. Um, they requested it, they petitioned the county, and they, they funded it. They funded it or the county funded it? They funded it through a special assessment. Um, the uh, Seahorse Mobile Home Park yes. assessment navigational dredge was paid for by. I we paid for part of it. I think that was we did an upstream project to reduce what was coming into the area. Okay. I remember and, we did something. Yeah. 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 Okay. So special assessments. Okay. The concept here is that those parties that are assessed enjoy a special benefit from a project or an activity versus a, a general benefit that the community would receive. And so the codes and policies that we have in place right now, again, the navigational dredging assessment is authorized under chapter 110 of the code, and that was recently updated last year. It uses the uniform method of assessment. Um, we haven't had any assessments since the early 2000s, but we've had a number of inquiries recently. Stormwater related assessments, again, we have we are authorized under Chapter 58, which is a surface water assessment. If we, if we needed to utilize that code for funding a project or program that was different from the general surface water assessment for maintenance and management. And then Chapter, again, 110 of the code allows for a community to come in and petition the county to restore their stormwater system. Um, the most recent we have on the books again is 2003. However, yesterday I got a phone call and a community is probably going to come in and ask for a special assessment. So, so we may have one in the near future. And then public lake improvements. That ordinance again has been in our in our code since the 70s. Um, it's currently authorized under Chapter 130. However, I would re recommend for cleanup purposes that we move it into Chapter 110 and we make it consistent with the rest of the assessments utilizing the uniform assessment and it does include vegetation management as a service. So some of those considerations and this has come up uh, in con the conversation several times. So when we're looking at you know public rights, private rights, you know there are you know trespassing concerns, you know, whether you have the right easement at the right location, the right license and acquisition, whether what we do and <clears throat> obviously the reason this is so important is that we go in there and we, we do something we may be held responsible for any future operations and maintenance of what we just did so we may be assuming responsibility if we don't have those rights and responsibilities clearly outlined and what we should and shouldn't be doing when we're working in sovereign submerged lands i mean obviously we just had a conversation about um, the the Shelby and ray canal area um, you assume it's owned by the state, and then it comes back, and guess what? It's private. You know, sovereign submerged lands are very difficult. Um, understanding who owns what can be very difficult. There are parcels all over the place that are in private ownership and public ownership. There are leases over those sovereign submerged lands that entities hold, which restricts anybody else's use. So this can be very complicated. And um, if you're working in sovereign submerged lands. You know, the state can require a lease agreement that then would make you responsible in perpetuity for managing what you've done. So just a lot of things to consider when we're, when we're considering working in sovereign commercial um, Special assessment, um, obviously uh, there are strict procedural requirements, noticing public hearings. Um, we also must be very sure that what we determine to be a special benefit area 
is reasonably apportioned to the properties in the right way. So if it, say, were a navigational dredge and somebody has a 50-foot wide you know, property, that's the only access they have, it's 50 feet wide, but the property down the street has 1,000 feet, the parcel that has 50 feet might not pay the same as the person who has 1,000 feet. Right? So we make sure that those are apportioned properly. And then it's also important to recognize that special assessments are voluntary, but they're not voluntary on everyone. So a special assessment requires 60% of the community to uh, approve it. I want to commit, we want to have a special assessment, and let's just say, you know, 60% of the residents along that channel say yes, but the other 40% say no. Well, the 40% can be voluntold that they're participating. So that's kind of how it it's set up. So 60% approval is all that's required, not 100%. Um, so it's not necessarily voluntary for every person. And then liabilities and damage. Um, risk of unearthing contamination, and that's where Commissioner Peter's point is well taken. Um, you might recall several years back, we had a request for an assessment navigation dredge up in Baywood Village um, in, in Palm Harbor, off of Klosterman, um, kind of west of Pittsburgh. Um, the sediments, after doing a detailed um, assessment, the sediments were very high in arsenic. And the recommendation, again, because of future liabilities and risk, that we would be responsible for that material forever was that we not proceed. And we did not do that project because of that future risk. So to Commissioner Peter's point about the Lake Lagori dredge project, where material um, you know, ended up on properties and now the city has responsibility to remove and, and um, dispose of that material um, in accordance with state laws for arsenic. It, it, it can create those future liabilities. So that risk component is very important to consider when you're looking at any of these projects. So that, that project, where is was that on private land or public land you're talking about? Baywood? Yeah. Baywood is private. It's um, the, kind of the canal right out, right. right kind of the end of right yeah. across from in there. And, um, they came in and requested an assessment bridge. And so the county went down the pathway. We started those initial because we have to do a determination, um, you know, how much sediment needs to be removed, what are the what are the estimated costs of the project so that we can tell the community, okay, this much material needs to be removed, the estimated cost is this, and then they make their community vote as to whether they want to proceed or not. So we don't go too far down the path before they say, yes, we want you to do it. When we were in that process, that's when the arsenic was discovered at sufficiently high concentrations that it caused us to step back and revisit it. And the recommendation was that we not proceed. So we did not. Because of the future liability to the county? Yes. So even though they wanted to, they still want to do that? Yes. And then we said we were out of it, that they could have done it themselves? Correct. I think all she cares that. No, I missed you. Did you go ahead up earlier? No, that was before. Um, and then, of course, you know, damaging private property. Um, you know, this comes up a lot um, with regard to working in Indian or private property, especially when there's freshwater systems and people have irrigation lines extending out into water, hitting those, knocking them down, damaging seawalls, damaging docks. Anytime we're working around in public areas where there's private infrastructure as well, there's a chance for damaging that property and then incurring future maintenance obligations. So we have to just be mindful and make sure that we have dotted all our I's, crossed all our T's, we fully evaluated everything. So special assessments would be over what period of time would they be assessed to, to repay the, the work? It depends. Okay. Yeah. So 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 if those folks, because I'm hearing that there, there, there's some folks that are still wanting us to do that. There's, they're coming back and saying we still want that special assessment. Again, special assessment involves us mm -hmm. as a financing partner, but what about the contracted part? Why do we assume that responsibility if, if they're asking for it and they want it done and this is just a way to finance it for them? Why do then we become the responsible party? If, you know, I just, that's the part I don't understand. When, the, when, when this actual assessment, I worked on this back many, many years ago, um, what happens in a special assessment like this, um, we're not just the financing mechanism, we actually perform the project. So in other words, we would be putting it out to bid, we would be hiring the contractor, we would be managing the project, 
And in this particular case, because of the high levels um, of arsenic that Kelly was referencing, the overwhelming concern that we had is, is given other environmental statutes out there, and it, it's been many years, so bear with me, I don't know whether it was a Superfund issue or some other environmental regulation, basically once you have touched something contaminated, you're really in the chain of possession. So if at some point in the future there's an issue, we would be held liable. By way of example, um, years and years ago, the county got involved in a Superfund case because used grease and oil that came from our fleet that was disposed of properly, it, a you know permitted and investigated, and we went through all the due, due diligence before we hired this disposal company. 15, 20 years later, they became a Superfund site, and we had to pay fines and penalties for all of the oil that we had disposed of there. Again, after due diligence and you know doing everything properly, so you could get into a project like this and again do everything properly and have it disposed of in what you have been led to believe is an appropriate manner at an appropriate site and still have pretty extreme liability. And that was the concern that we had: is basically once you have touched it, you are forever in that chain. And did you get a sense from the people there that they didn't want to do it either for the same reasons, or they just wanted us to do it? And to, to, they didn't know about the arsenic. Yeah. Um, it, it came out as part of the um, part of the initial investigations. Now, recently, um, we received another request for assessment dredge up on Blue Jay, and um, which is in the same area. It's a different canal, but it's in the same area. And so, I made them aware of what we found during the Baywood Village assessment. I looked at the work. Um, there was no sampling done in their area. I said, so I just wanted to make you aware that we could end up in the same situation, just given proximity. Um, but if you wanted to move forward to let me know, I gave them all the history so they have all those documents and, and can make so an the, informed decision. So the work that we go through on that, then that they can use that work and hire their own contractor and do it? I mean, as far as... Of course. As I mean, they're, they're, anybody can go out and go through the same process the county would go through to design, engineer, and permit a project, construct it. Yes. I mean, I just, the, the idea of having arsenic in your canal just it seems bothersome to me. And, uh, you know, like, we should be doing something about it. But I understand the issues that you brought up, but I mean, there may be a lot of concerns on that front. Maybe they're ready to do so. I, I'm not saying they're ready to do something on their own. I'm just saying. Well, arsenic is a naturally occurring substance in floral soils. Okay. So there are natural sources. There are unnatural sources. And our history here, as citrus is a big source back in the day, um, uh, you know, uh, golf courses up until 2010 used arsenic-based products for fungus control. Um, so, you know, it's, it's... So these are probably not naturally occurring. Maybe a combination of both, but you know, okay. obviously our, our history and given our urban nature, there's a lot of different sources. Thank you. I did have a quick question about that. What give us a real quick summary on the same key issue. Did they not have the same kind of testing in place for the Lake Memorial Dredge? And when was that? I remember. I was out there, so um, I can't remember the exact year as well over 10 years ago because I actually went down to that project to kind of glean information because we were doing working on Lake Seminole at the time and I wanted to kind of see their process and their program. Um, I was not privy to their sediment um, testing um, results so I need to really kind of look at that to see what happened whether it was there are two things that can happen one it could have been high really high and um, they thought because it met um, residential criteria and it was being placed on a property um, or it, was paid, it met commercial criteria um, but not residential criteria that's going on a piece of property that might be commercial in the future that would be fine but then if somebody comes in and wants to put residential on the property now we're not fine so it may have been a looking at that I'm just speculating completely um, but another factor is you can have arsenic in organic soils and those organic soils are going to essentially compost through time they break down and so that arsenic can concentrate and then be higher than it was when you tested it during the project and so it may be a combination of one or both of those situations i don't know the entire history i just i kind of heard uh you know from my colleagues down there that that this had occurred and 
kind of brought it to my attention. Well, Commissioner Peters is going to forward the info she has. Um, do you know where the fill ended up? Um, I have that. Yeah, she where, has. Where did yeah. it end up? It's on, uh, I think, two or three different areas of the Jabel property. Uh, some Gandy property, which the city just recently removed once they got the lawsuit. And then, according to the documents, also in Toy Town. And is the state looking at this? Um, they will be once that lost. DEP is the letter that has all the descriptions. So DEP has been looking at it, okay. and where the resolution is, I don't know. But at this point, I don't know how I can help my constituent unless you know the courts. Can, I think it's a court issue at this point. Sure. Thank you. So just looking at some other Tampa Bay jurisdictions, I reached out to some of my colleagues around the area just to kind of see how they handle things. So the city of St. Petersburg funds navigational drilling in what they call arterial waterways of the city. So those are waterways that are of citywide interest. They're, they're used by the general voting public and they're important for that reason. So the, the city will fund those. They actually have a map showing which ones they are. And then local waterways are dredged through an assessment process not different from what we do. So, um, so it's kind of a mix between that, that public general purpose use and then more of that special benefit use. And then they handle aquatic plant management the same way we do. So where the city has rights, responsibilities, owns land, um, they manage it, and where it benefits private property owners for navigational or aesthetic purpose, the property owner handles it. Hillsborough County navigational dredging is implemented through an assessment process. And again, aquatic plant management is identical to the way we, we handle it today. Um, Manatee County is actually within the West Coast Inland Navigation District. And so if a waterway is deemed to be um, provide service to the general voting public, it might qualify for funding under that program. Otherwise, those types of private or finger canals, residential, are handled through assessment. And they also, again, their aquatic plant management policies and procedures are aligned with the counties. So we're kind of like a little combination of both, uh, both a couple of these. Because I mean, yeah. our navigation is handled through assessment, except in a couple, of, except for a couple of areas. Yeah. And we also have the federal component too. Yeah. So. Um, so, in summary, you know, our policy basically, you know, advises that where we have ownership or defined rights and responsibilities, um, the county has the right to do that work. Um, if there's a larger public benefit, like that Curly Channel A project, again, public funding can be utilized as a tool for financing those improvements uh, because of that. Uh, where the benefits primarily serve specific property owners, uh, special assessments are considered. We have um, three ordinances, Chapter 110 Special Assessments, the Public Lake Improvement Ordinance in Chapter 130, which I, again, would recommend we, we revisit and uh, revise that. And then, of course, the Chapter 58 is which where our Surface Water Assessment Code lies. Agency responsibilities, we had a lot of conversation about the federal, um, federal pieces of the intercoastal waterway and some of the inlets and how that material is managed and used um, for beneficial reuse uh, on our beaches. Um, the county, again, our county ownership or rights and responsibilities are clearly defined. And then currently, Florida Fish and Wildlife is providing lake-wide management of those three invasive species on Lake Tarpon. And then the considerations that we went through looking at the public versus private rights and setting precedent, what certain projects might, might cause us to do, um, the risks associated with that, sovereign submerged lands and any the difficulty in kind of understanding those pieces and making sure that we're clear on who owns what, where, and when, because it changes. Um, the process for special assessments and just understanding that it is a voluntary process and there are procedures that we need to go through and then any liability that we could potentially have for damaging property or for undercovering, undercovering um, contamination and how we deal with that. So, you know, I, I, I want to thank Kelly because this was, she got it done into kind of a bite-sized piece, but this is the one that's a lot of work to pull this together. But to try to summarize it into some public policy discussions, you can see it's just not easy. Um, there's a lot of different examples. And so they're trying to 
each, each time somebody comes to us, we're trying to apply, we're trying to be consistent, uh, knowing that there's a lot of different factors that go into each one of them, and, and everybody can find something from the past where it was different. And so <laughs> that, that makes it even more difficult. So that's why, um, that's the reason we want to kind of lay, lay out all the things that they're dealing with. She's also got a map, you know, that, that then I think helps uh, kind of give you a picture, uh, a visual picture of the various issues between kind of North and South County. Uh, and, and, um, and these are the ones we've assumed responsibility. Those are actually the ones that I spoke to today in the presentation. So they're both private and public. So you can see Hurricane Pass right down the left. That's one where we did it, but um, Hidden Meadows, I'm just gonna step up here. Um, Hidden Meadows, this was the 2003 assessment for their private stormwater system. So just kind of, I know that I was giving examples of projects all over the place, but I wanted to make sure that um, I think the point she was trying to make is that they're all over. <laughs> you know, in, in some way, shape, or form, there's there's a number of, of challenges, and, and they're throughout the county. Question. Uh, just a couple of comments, if you could. First of all, Kelly, thank you. This is this is really difficult stuff. It's very complicated. I really appreciate you making an effort to bring it forward. I hope we can get this presentation available so that you know there's some folks that have been interested in hearing this, so we can make sure that it's available to folks online. Uh, We'll be sending out some of this information and this tape, taping, as it were, that we've done for this meeting so that folks can actually see some of that preliminary conversation. So I hope we can get that. And then going forward, I, I would agree, I think we need to have some public interfacing at different places in our county to have this discussion. Because I think just from an information standpoint, so many people don't understand. Uh, you know, we've had discussions about the creek responsibility, and um, I would never want to buy anything on water, any type of water, period, because it is just so unclear uh, going in whose responsibility is what. And um, and so I think we're, at least what I was told, that we're doing a better job reaching out to our, our, our residential realtors to let them know. Uh, I'm not sure that I was one of them being one. Um, that put it always in their hands is, as it, it comes to a closing, sometimes things tend to be, be forgotten. But I do think it's important that we keep reaching out and educating people because the expectations that people have when they buy a piece of property, I'm thinking about the canals on Lake Tarpon, for instance, when we changed, I didn't, we changed what we were doing because of the economic downturn. We looked at things and people may have come into that neighborhood, may not have done their research and then just but some may have done their research, and then all of a sudden there was a change, and then so it's a new responsibility. I just think it's really important on us to be able to understand and clearly articulate these these things that are going on, because I, I, now that I've done this, I'd like to do it again, just to make sure I really get what you've said, because it's really, it's really good stuff. So thank you for that. But I really hope that we can take this out on the road and talk to folks before we come to any kind of proposed changes. Just kind of FYI, back in 2010, it wasn't just Lake Tarpon. It was other places through the county where we said we're no longer doing this. It was also different right-of-way responsibilities that we said we're no longer in this business. Um, it was it was pretty comprehensive. It well, wasn't just Lake Tarpon, what you're saying. It was not just Lake Tarpon. Right, no, I understand. I'm just yeah. saying. But I was using that as an example of some of the things that we've heard from them is like. No, I just wanted to reassure you, it just wasn't in one area. Exactly. You have to do this and then I know. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's so, that's Madam Chair, I would just like to uh, make a comment that I was on the commission when we had several discussions about these canals and whose responsibility. Remember when we were going through the stormwater management fee and implementing that? how difficult that was with poor Kelly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, she took the brunt of an awful lot of that and it is very difficult for our citizens to absorb that once we used to do this and now we don't. And to Commissioner Egger's point about taking this out on the road, I, I did hear you, Kelly or Rahim, when you said, keep in mind, we have five thousands of these minimum in the county 
yeah, that a lot of people probably aren't even aware of because they bought their homes a long time ago. And I just worry that we will incite a real, do you know what I mean, backlash. But this, this, this 5,000 isn't really all related to what we're talking about today. This was Pond's well, pond responsibility. Right. So the numbers, well, I don't, I don't know. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it yeah, could I be even it. more than 5,000, I heard Raheem well, say. Well, it's not just Pond. Was it at other areas where Canals? Yeah, yeah, water the, the, one of the right. hardest. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've got, a lot. I mean, I'll give you an example of a request that I had to work with Brendan on numerous times. And a gentleman lives um, south of the tides and on a finger canal and he is having navigation issues just for his boat and he wanted a special assessment for essentially two or three properties and i work very closely with the county attorney's office because you know there's special assessment there still has to be an underlying public purpose to that and essentially dredging boat basins for three property owners doesn't achieve that threshold and it was very difficult, continues to be very difficult to communicate that message, you know, because they feel, well, I'm a member of the public, therefore it benefits me, and therefore I should qualify for this program. But it, it's, it is very difficult, and I, I understand. Um, I, I'd also want to just reiterate that I still can't figure out why we were working on Lake Tarpon as long as we were. And to be frank, I was. You know, from 2013 to 2016, vegetation management was actually under my purview, and we didn't work in the canals at that time. Um, one of the staff who used to actually physically do that harvesting work is still here, retiring in like five minutes. <laughs> so, so I spent After this presentation. quite a bit of time with him, downloading his brain, going through old documents, and I'm like, Mike, why did we keep doing this after 1996? And he goes, I have no idea, Kelly, because the agreement said we should have stopped. Kelly, if you, if you could, though, because we have talked about a lot, you know, here, but it really, some of these drainage areas, um, so if you can, just kind of give them an overview of the drainage code, because, you know, that, that really talks about some of these backyard issues and why my fence is falling in, you're not going in and clearing that area that you know you must have responsibility for because it drains water and I can't build it in. And you know, to Barry's point, sometimes this stuff gets very complicated very quickly, and it, and it has to do with our development history. Finding permits for a lot of this stuff is very hard sometimes, and you know, permit compliance and part of you know, pond compliance part is something that my staff do and. You're going in trying to find site plans from 1970 or anything that gives us an idea of what was supposed to be there at the time. That can be challenging in and of itself. And then when you're, somebody calls and, and they're very upset, and I've taken these calls, I, I get the anxiety and they've got water creeping up to their house and it's within 10 feet and they're like, you have to do something. But when we do our due diligence and we go and we get those site plans and we look at it, we go out there and essentially what we found is that there's 10 properties and there's a backyard swale that conveys that water from this road through those back properties within the neighborhood and ultimately out to the other side where it now falls into another part of the system and property number one has filled in their part of the swale property number two has a, has a fence there property number three built a built a storage structure property number four has you, you see where i'm going here Every single property has done something that now prohibits that water from making it to point A to point B, and there, help us. And so the message really now is, let me help you help yourself, because let's, let's show you where you are. Here's your site plan. This is private drainage. It's lot to lot and only serves this private area. It's not public water. It's your water. And so if you go in here and you relocate your fence and fix this area, the water will get from here to here, and here's what you need to do. And unfortunately, sometimes people don't want to do that. They don't want to accept the responsibility for it, and then we have to go through this code enforcement process of restoring the system. And that's, it's painful for everyone. <laughs> it's, it's yeah, I think, I think the public hearing the historical perspective and the scope that we're talking about will at least give them a feel for, they may not like it, what they're hearing, but it at least gives them a feel for where they fit in this 
this big discussion that's going on, uh, some which may involve some code changes and others may not. You know, we at the end of the day, we're probably not going to make a lot of changes to it, but there may be some things that make sense. But if they if they know how they fit into this and I think big picture, might... excuse me. No, no, right, just to build on that, I think it could be helpful for them to see the bigger picture of the watersheds and how the water moves. I mean, you're, you live in the middle of water and how that water drains and where, not in a whole lot of detail, but the big systems. And the big systems are ours generally, and the rest of it is not. You know, you got to get your water to this part so we can take care of the rest. Yeah, and there's, I mean, there's projects like, you know, the Cross Bayou one that I showed you that there's a section, you know, that, that needs maintenance, but we don't have the rights. We don't have easements. It is in private ownership. There is a greater public benefit to getting that cleared. The Cross Bayou watershed is huge. It drains over 8,000 acres to that canal. You know, improving that system would provide a great public benefit, but if we don't have those rights, you know, we can't. And so, you know, it's, you know, so when people come in and say, I want you to do this, they say, well, you know, you gotta make that policy decision. Is this something we should do? Yes or no, or is it something they need to do? If, if the county decides that is something we should do, then it's obtaining those rights and responsibilities and frankly sometimes they just say no and that's you know we have a case now where they've said you know it needs clear but i'm not going to provide you an easement okay so yeah just you know yeah and just like you know, there's a creek that goes i think it's smith smith creek anyway it goes right through it and on the east side of county road one there's been a lot of work that we've done and on the west side of county road one uh, the only responsibility we have is if a tree falls in the, in the and it blocks the water flow but those those property owners have problems they have issues and it's a public creek so to speak because it does help drain a, a basin area to the to the intercoastal so it's just it's so uh, making people uh, educating folks to understand is is a difficult part of this process some really don't know that um, buyer beware but that's a shame that we get to that kind of condition and why are we doing it on one side of the road and not the other side I'm sure there's some reasons but people out there are looking and wondering so it's a complicated thing and part of Part of that point, Commissioner, um, part of the method we use to evaluate the larger public purpose is through our watershed management plans, which that's a perfect yeah. example. Uh, what Smith Creek is going through that process right now. We have recommended projects that show this regional benefit. They get programmed into our CIP, prioritized countywide. So there's a process you have to go through. That. And that needs to be kind of passed, sure. passed along too to our residents. So. And, you know, we did this throughout the county. I mean, I, I have one just that Kelly just described where your backyard's filled in, they put fences up, and somebody came in, bought a new property in this area, and he's suddenly like, oh, I'm getting faulted that I don't have drainage here. Well, it's a backup ditch or backup drainage system for the whole neighborhood that when a private developer went in, that was part of the agreement, and that's how we developed a lot of Pinellas right. County by letting this and become the private developers' issues. I mean, Kent Place is another example. Mm -hmm. We've had a long and you can, issue. You also you, you'll never see it as a hundred percent. Also, and and the re reason I bring I only bring that up is somebody said, well, we went into this area; it was private. We didn't go into this area. Well, you know, we've got twenty five hundred. Um, employees that are trying to do the right thing um, and when they're out and somebody complains and they go in and they clear it and they maybe have it checked back with, with with Kelly or something like that I mean those things are just gonna happen because they're really wanting to do things it's when we kind of look at it we have to assess that policy and so I hope you know we're, we're cognizant that you know th those types of things happen even even with our best intention of trying to be consistent to Commissioner Seal's point about you know the backyard private systems, those are very challenging. We deal with them a lot. Our new code doesn't allow them. All right, so I think there's our new stormwater code does not allow those backyard swale systems for exactly this. Those reasons. Yeah. So what happens to them thing. if they're already there? If they're already there. The the residents who have acquired the property are responsible for the management of that. Or it could fall if there's an HOA. Sometimes it's an HOA. Um, you know, I can, I, 
to, to Commissioner Seal's point, we literally are we're dealing with a, a pond that was out of compliance and the community's flooding. They're flooding because they failed to maintain their pond. We are going through the compliance process with them. A brand new homeowner came in and bought in. He had no idea that we were going through this process. And so he just fell into it because he brought a new piece of property. Right. And he's obviously very upset that it wasn't disclosed that there was this yeah. issue. Well, so it's education all around. Well, you know, let's go to a wider issue, which I don't know how we do this, but we should be talking with the realtors organization to try to get better disclosure of kind of sale of the property and do some education that. in that regard because it's not just this issue, it's so many different issues. You know, a case would be that they have to annex into a city or in that end, we've had that problem before where they weren't disclosed that they would have to annex. And so why don't we get Joe Farrell to come in here? And I think we should do, ask for better um, disclosure. Yeah, we have, um, I mean, I went to them when I had, I, I'll do a personal example. I had Chinese drywall in my house that cost me personally $300,000 to fix. And, you know, there's, I went to the realtors organization I said, all I'm asking is that you do as part of your process, if the house is built between this time period, that you tell them that Chinese drywall was present. Not necessarily in their house, but have it tested. I just wanted to help other people. I even went to um, Congress asking for them to do something different. Just because it's, you know, it is really buyer beware in a case like that. Yep. And, you know, it has some terrible consequences on folks. Um, or all the things that they're encountering when they go to closing. Now, our floodplain administrator, Lisa Foster, has been working very, very closely with the Realtors Association with regard to disclosure about flooding issues, <coughs> flooding issues um, to make, to help inform buyers, future buyers of, of these risks. And, and there, there's obviously a lot more opportunity um, you know, with regard to working with them on, on these issues. And she has specifically you know, asked, do we have this information where we can point to a pond and say, who's responsible for that pond? That way we can give that to the Realtors Association and they can say, it's just right now we don't have that information. It is so, um, you know, back there was a certain period of time we developed where the ponds are, you go into the property appraiser's mapping, you'll look at it and it looks like the pond is a pie. And every homeowner has a slice of the pie. And then we moved into a place where the pond was owned by the HOA, but the HOA doesn't exist anymore. Now who owns right. it? And then we've got master associations and we've got, so it's, our development history is kind of determined who's responsible. So to that end, maybe there is a list that we can even prepare, even if we did it through our consumer protection, um, where we say, you know, if you're buying a house, look or ask for the following things. You know, look and see if you have drainage easements. Look and see, you know, and it, and it might not be all inclusive, but it could at least be informative to someone. And then we could, you know, I think we should approach the realtors and say, we have been encountering all of these problems in Pinellas County. And, you know, we're asking that you help us to educate the consumers. And Madam Chair, what about, is there a list anywhere of all of the homeowner associations that we have in the county? Because I live in a homeowners association and I guarantee you that they are not aware of the issues that are surrounding our little ponds mm -hmm. in, in the neighborhood I live in. And one day we're going to get a huge surprise with a big fine for not caring for those ponds properly. Okay. And we do have a list of... Oh, oh my God. <laughs> Give me your address and I'm just saying. <laughs> I don't know how accurate it is, but for years we've had lists of homeowners associations whenever we mean... Well, couldn't Barbara prepare a flyer that just speaks to the homeowners associations and the fact that it's their responsibility? Right to care for them. Well, they're all very different. So some of them are individual homeowners. They're yeah. not the HOA. Yeah, and and the other thing is, what does pond? What does maintaining your system mean? We've had that education lesson with numerous communities. Um, say they come in for a credit on their assessment, 
and we go out there and we find their pond is non compliant, so they don't qualify. So we go through, here are the things you'll need to do in order to bring your pond back into alignment with your site plan and in compliance, and then you're eligible for your credit. And they're like, well, what do you mean? You know, we've had a pond management company out here for 25 years. I said, well, spraying aquatic vegetation isn't management. You know, it's right. maintaining the That's structure, removing the sediment. Right. They, they don't, there's just, there's a complete disconnect between yeah. what actual right. stormwater management versus, you know, maintaining the pond for aesthetics. It's very, they're very different activities. Thank you. You mentioned, before we got meandering down this uh, path, but. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. Um, you mentioned something about private ownership of lands causing an issue at, in the Cross Bayou area. And I, I just missed what the what the issue was. I, I mean, what there's, they were. There's some flooding. And while the area is in a floodplain and, you know, it's not going to fully be resolved, you know, the canal is, you know, kind of congested in that area, but but the property rights the lot or property rights are with the upland owners, not the county. Do you mean the upland as far as all the way past North Park over and all the way that far north or just certain we're going marching through a process because we have this whole cross bayou canal project and we're doing it kind of in sections and different areas have different levels of um, we have rights in some areas, some areas we have yes and no, in some areas we have flat out no. And so in order to truly get in there and do this greater project that has a greater public good, we really need rights over the whole area. And there's significant development coming in that area too. Okay. Thank you very much, Kelly. Thank you. You're awesome. I appreciate it. As always. Okay, um, Jewel wanted to mention something before we started the agenda briefing. I think most of you, except for Commissioner Peters, have seen the confidential memos. There were two in here. I just wanted to make sure everybody saw that there were two memos in here. And there were one was outgoing funds and one was in funds, right? Here. Sure yes, I read them both as outgoing. I almost had a meltdown <laughs> sitting over <right> here. <laughs> <laughs> Should have put a red line under the <laughs> incoming part. <laughs> Do I want to take a quick five minute break? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. 11.30. Okay. We've got about eight minutes. We'll start at 11.30. What are we doing for lunch? Do we have lunch? Um, I don't think we have anything. We just do. But I mean, don't we have another one right after this? We have the 